Um, thanks everyone for joining us for today's Long Life Management virtual webinar. So excited to have you joining us and we have some excellent speakers lined up today that are going to discuss various aspects of how to manage your Long Life Pine. Uh, myself and Lisa Lord will be moderating the webinar. Uh, just a couple of friendly reminders um, while you're here in the webinar today. Make sure to keep your video and camera off um, while the speakers are presenting um, and your microphones muted as well. You can put any of your questions in the chat box and um, we'll be monitoring that for your questions while people are presenting and there will be time at the end of each presentation for um, the presenter to respond. Um, we'll also have a table at the end of the webinar just to help um, so with planning for future webinar topics that y'all might find interesting um, and help about and um, we'd really appreciate any feedback you have. Um, and I'll just, also just wanted to give a brief background. Um, today's webinar is hosted um, by and in support of the Okie Finoki Osceola uh, local implementation team. Um, and so America's Longleaf Restoration Initiative, um, the vision is to have a functional, viable longleaf pine ecosystems. Um, with the full spectrum of values that go along with that, including ecological, economic, and social. Um, so far, implementation teams and other collaborative efforts are in 18 locations across nine states um, within the Longleaf Range. And today's webinar hosted by the Okefenokee Osceola Partnership um, and the local implementation team, they work in South Georgia and North Florida as well. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, Rebecca Shelton for Conservancy is the um, local implement coordinator for that. And um, now let me introduce our first speaker is gonna be Mark McClellan. Um, he is the stewardship coordinator for the Georgia Forestry Commission. Um, and he'll be discussing managing longleaf for timber. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to you, Mark. All right, thank you. Thanks for having me, um, <clears throat> Susan. So we've heard, you know, many talks on establishing longleaf and um, growing them in fire and all that, but uh, we very seldom talk about how to manage longleaf, especially especially older trees. I thought it would be pretty cool just to touch on that. Uh, I could talk about this, I don't know, for hours, but uh, I, I'm gonna try to pack as much as I can into 15 minutes. So we'll see how this goes. I just opted out of having a PowerPoint, so you're just gonna have to, to hear me talk a little bit for, or at least for 15 minutes today. So just, let's just go over some characteristics of uh, longleaf in general. So we, you know, they tend to be better, you know, great wildlife trees. I don't necessarily think that maybe, maybe not the longleaf per se, but it allows you, longleaf does allow you, it's adapted to fire. So it allows you to manage your understory. So that's why we want to plant longleaf for, for wildlife purposes, because the way the trees grow, it allows light like to get to the understory and we can manage our understory better with longleaf. Uh, they tend to be more insect and disease resistant compared to slash or, or loblolly. Um, they tend to do a little better in, in storms and this just because they're deep rooted on, on many of the deep, especially the deep sandy sites. Um, and the quality of timber, you know, is, is really good with longleaf. I mean, it produces good pulp, chip and saw, saw timber poles depending on your side index. Uh, side index, of course, is, is the height. Uh, a timber timber grows in like any particular, like a set time period, like 25 years, 50 years, and it allows foresters just to evaluate the site. Um, Longleaf sometimes get a bad rap because of how slow they grow. They tend to grow a little bit slower uh, than your typical slash or loblolly, but um, they usually, at the end of the at the end of the rotation, usually usually your rates of return are pretty pretty evenly. They just takes a little bit longer for them to get there. They're usually five to seven years on average behind, uh, say a, say a slash loblolly. Um, so be patient when growing these things when, when growing these trees. Um, you know, plan them and grow them for long term investments. Um, that that's what I always tell landowners. Uh, you can you know like a. a um, if you're just interested in timber, you grow loblolly and, and harvest it at, you know, 13 years. If you grow longleaf, or, or I say harvest it, thin it at 13 years old. But if you grow longleaf, you know, you might have to thin it at 20 years old. So usually it's, you know, you can, you can count on five to seven years past that. Um, 
for timber purposes, we normally grow longleaf to around 50 years old. Um, and at 50 years old, you start seeing your best quality salt timber and poles. And um, from stands that I've witnessed over the years, if you got a 50, when, when that longleaf starts reaching that 50 year mark, you start seeing 60, 70% poles in that particular stand. So uh, they go really tall, really straight, uh, good quality poles and salt timber. Uh, so let's just go over a typical scenario. Um, so first of all, um, always, always manage your timber based on your goals and objectives. If you don't take anything else away from today, remember, remember that goals and objectives. And only y'all can, you, the landowner, can determine those goals and objectives. And then once, once we can identify your goals and objectives, us as foresters can help you get there. Um, you know, so a typical one we go over today is say, say you ask me to, you got, you you want to man, you want to get the most out of your long leaf, but you want to manage for timber. Okay, we 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 can we can work with that. Um, so typically, you grow. Um, you say you got an eighteen year old stand of, of long leaf. Um, you, might, you might be raking straw right now, so we want to give you a couple more years of rake straw. It hadn't quite reached you know the time where you really needs to be thinned. So let's 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 look at thinning at, at twenty years old. Um, and typically what you want to do is go in there and do a fifth or even a seventh row thin and you take out your bad trees. You take out your poor form trees, your, your fork trees, your uh, any any disease like fusiform. Uh, Lonely do get some fusiform rust on. So on your first thin and make sure you take those trees out. You want to leave the best trees per acre. Um, and for timber, for, for timber goals and objectives, uh, you want to thin it back to what foresters call basal area, um, 70, about 70 square feet of basal area. So basal area is, is just a cross section area of a, of a tree at four and a half feet above the ground. So say you had, so 70 square feet, so you would have so many trees and if you cut them all off at four and a half feet, you will have 70 square feet of, you know, of surface area in those stumps. So that's what basal area is. It just gives foresters a way to uh, identify stocking levels. Um, so you thin, you thin at 20 years old, you grow them out maybe say 10 more years um, and you do your second thin. Uh, at this time, I would recommend have, having, I would start marking them. Anytime, any harvest I would do after that first thin, I would start marking them, um, you know, by a forester or a consultant forester um, to make sure you're, you're, you're leaving the best trees per acre. Um, and what's the beautiful thing about longleaf that I've witnessed over the years is they continue to grow, like especially compared to say species like, like slash pine. Uh, slash pine will stagnate on you if you don't thin and take care of it at about 18 to 20 years old. Longleaf, you can, you can, you, you know, even at 20, 30 years, when you release it, you can get, you can often get really good growth rates um, after, after the thinning. So longleaf's pretty unique in that area as well. Um, but I would, uh, you know, you want to grow your, your mature, mature timber out about 50 years. So you got the opportunity to do one or two, you know, thins throughout that rotation. Um, you know, then consider your final harvest about 50 years old, depending on the health of the trees, depending on your markets, um, and other things you might be interested in at that time. Um, we can go over another scenario, say, say you have an existing stand of trees. So the first thing you want to do is determine, you know, your average age, you know, you want to uh, determine the health, uh, maybe some, maybe the growth rates and maybe your stock in. So that, that'll help you determine in, in your goals and objectives for that particular stand. Um, to me, I don't see enough landowners doing this, a lot of times they'll get to a certain point and it gets clear cut. I mean, so I always encourage landowners, if they got a natural stand of a long leaf, take advantage of it. Let's do something. Let's think out the box. Let's, let's, let's do some unique opportunities and let's thin it and, and uh, get, get some really, you know, get that understory um, help going and, and, and let's work with this stand. And <clears throat> so I usually, and, and even for timber purposes, you want to, you know, say thin back to 70 square feet of basal area, even if it's a natural stand. Um, but where people make, uh, often make mistakes when thinning these type 
stands is they want to they you know they want to take out the small trees we want to take out the worst trees in the stand maybe even the biggest trees um and you want to leave that healthy stand of trees after that first thinning so um and some a lot of times you know that people tend to and I, I see even to this day and we've preached on it my whole career over, over the past 30 years uh they take out you know some of the smaller trees and you leave the big ones on. so that that's considered high grading and that can ruin the stand pretty quick so we want to try to avoid that at all cost um you know also after that first thin and i'm still talking about natural stands uh this is the time you want to think about uh, depending on the age, especially depending on the age of the stand, you want to start thinking about how you want to reforest that in the future. Even if you don't plan to clear cut anytime soon, you need to be thinking about how, how you're going to get to that. Say, say the stand's 30 years old, so you know, you, you know, you might want to let it grow 15 more years for you, and then for your final harvest. So if you want natural regeneration, uh, you might want to consider a shelter wood cut or some alternative types of, of harvesting besides just a clear cut. Uh, shelter woods where you just cut out certain areas in the stand and, and, and let that stand you know, regenerate in, in the open areas. Uh, and then you can go back later and cut out the bigger trees if, if, if you desire to do that. Um, or you may just decide to clear cut and, and start over. Um, and that will be your decision. Um, I will. Um, Take this in consideration, trees, when they reach that 45, 50 years old, a lot of times they start getting heart rot. This is for all species of pines, just not, not, not long leaf, and it's just how they grow. Uh, so be mindful of that uh, if you're wanting to grow timber. So a lot of times, or oftentimes, you, you may have a big, pretty stand of trees um, with a lot of, but a lot of those trees are gonna have heart rot and they'll be holly inside and it makes that trees way less valuable. Uh, so just take that in consideration. And also the mills aren't taking, um, aren't, aren't taking the bigger trees for, for ply logs and stuff like that like they used to. So that market's, that market's dwindling pretty fast. There's only a few, a few plywood mills and, and uh, mills that would take stuff like that left in, in Georgia. Uh, very few, well, across the Southeast United States rather. Uh, there's only just a few left so uh, that's another thing to consider you know you got a 30 40 year old standalone leaf you might want to you might you might want to consider a clear cut as bad as, I, bad as I hate to say that um but this is that uh, granted this is for growing timber that's your goal you know uh, if your goal is to grow timber just just a consideration um also want to talk about the just I've looked up the internal rate of return for long leaf on average sites. Um, just, just considering the timber values, you're going to get anywhere from eight to 10% um, on your harvest, on your rotation. Uh, if you rate pine straw, um, and this comes from, these are studies from UGA. I just took the high points. Um, pine straw, you're estimated anywhere from 20 to 30% if you rate pine straw and then harvest your timber. Um, and for if you have cost share, um, we're talking CRP and, and others. And then when, when you cost share um, year ends, you start raking straw. So your internal rate of returns can be anywhere from 30 to 40 percent. That's pretty good investment on your money right there for long leave. And, uh, that's some, something, you know, something to consider. Uh, pretty, 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 pretty good versus you no. Know, Planting other species, so that's a good talking point um, when people ask you, "Why? Well, what do I need to plant?" You know, um, so only if it isn't that bad if you take advantage of some of the programs that's out there and 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 raking pine straw. Uh, also, wanted so how much time do I got left? You you still got a few minutes, Mark. Okay, I want to talk about just general tips for selling timber. Um, Always before a timber sale, you know, consider hiring, consider hiring a consultant or uh, the minimum, at least call, call one of us at the Forestry Commission to help you, you know, kind of point you in the right direction. Um, and, and do this before the harvest too. Don't wait. <laughs> Oftentimes I have landowners call me, um, what, what do I need to do? And I go out there and they're already cutting and 
you know, a lot of times it, it can be a mess. So, so plan ahead, um, you know, consider that consultant or call us and, and, you know, we'll get you started in the right direction when, you know, to, and help you sell that timber um, as efficiently and quickly and easily as possible. Because uh, for, for some, a lot of landowners, it, it is, um, it's a big deal. I mean, you, you grow, you're talking about in investments, you've been growing for 50 years. We want to make sure, you know, you get the most money out of, out of, out of, out of it. Uh, just some just some general tips. I go over a few of these. So the first thing you want to do is establish your boundaries. Um, you know, the last thing we want to do is is cut everyone's place property um, boundaries. Um, you know, if you got streams, you want to mark your streams. You know, determine the areas that the loggers want. You know, you want your loggers to stay out of. Um, determine your access and where your log index are going to be. Um, very, very important that access, like that's determining you no know, roads in and out of the stand, uh, and 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 mark where you mark, mark where you want your log index. You know, um, that's that's because you you could use log index for for food plots and open areas and other things later on. Um, identify what you want to cut and identify the value of it. Really important before you know before you can before you sell your timber. Know what you're know what you're selling. Um, advertise the sale, um, you know, determine the best method. It may be, you may want to, a lot of times landowners sell it by the unit to get more money like that. Um, but, it, but it requires keeping up with the, the loads and, and a little bit more work, or you could do it lump sum. That's just everything you get paid up front for whatever, you know, the amount of timber that's out there. Um, also encourage if you do, when you want to sell, don't, don't just use one timber buyer, you know, send out several bids, um, send out, you know, contact as many, many loggers as possible. Um, and, and sometimes the ones in, and ask for, ask for references. Um, I, I, I've done that with my own timbers, no, nothing wrong with that. And, uh, you know, you don't, sometimes you got somebody to make offer you to, to top money, but he may not be the best, the best logger in the world. You know, you know, you might have a reputation of leaving trash on a property or what you want to know that up front. Um, and most important thing, if you decide to sell timber is execute a contract. Um, gosh, that's so important. And, and, you know, don't, don't, don't just do it on a handshake. Uh, make sure you got your legal description, make sure your payments, how you going to get paid in there. Uh, make sure there's any permits you might need. Take care of that. You know, uh, make sure that's identified in your contract. Um, make sure look look for any login clauses like BMPs. Um, you know, managing your stump heights. You don't want you know tall stump heights. Out there. You want to cut your stumps as low as possible. Make sure there's you put in there. You don't want trash left on the property. Um, you know how you want your roads retired or, or built. Um, Make sure all that's in your contract. Please have a contract before you, before you do any kind of timber deals. Um, and then monitor your logging. Don't just um, don't just take for granted that you know they're going to do what they're supposed to do. Stay on stay on top of it. Don't you know go out be on be on the site as much as you can. Uh, landowners, uh, I tell people this all the time. It's you know it's really important to do that. Um, and then close out your sale. That means, you know, you go out there and have a, have a post-harvest inspection after you sell your timber. And, um, you know, you may want to retire the site. That means, you know, put your, put your, retire your roads, make sure they're grassed over and, and to make sure, you know, if you want your logging debris spread on the site, it's different, you know, all, all that stuff, make sure you close out your sale. Uh, so that, that's, that's pretty much all I had. Um, Felt like I went through that pretty quick. I wasn't sure if I was going to pack that in there in, in, in 15 minutes or not. But um, hopefully I uh, maybe gener hopefully generated a few questions for you. So feel free to ask um, during Q&A. Thanks, Mark. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, something I thought of, Mark, while you were talking, um, I know you mentioned, you know, having folks call y'all before the harvest, you know, the, their loggers out there doing stuff. Is there any cost to the landowner if they contact their local GFC office to get y'all to come out, you know, and help or write, write a management plan, stewardship plan, um, anything like that? Uh, no, no cost for stewardship plans or, or uh, advice. 
we'd be more than happy to do that. That's one of the services we provide. So please take advantage of that. I encourage all landowners to. Awesome. Well, if anyone has any questions that come up, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to our next speaker, Tony. Um, he is a private lands wildlife biologist with Georgia DNR, um, and he's going to uh, be talking about managing longleaf for wildlife habitat. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to you, Tony, if you want to share your presentation. You see it? Yes, looks good. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so my name is Tony Kroger, um, and I'll be talking about longleaf, um, mostly longleaf, but also this a lot of this applies to any pine species, um, management for wildlife, and kind of the way I structured this, I'm going to try to cram a lot in, um, but kind of taking a stand from we've decided to plant trees and then on from there. Um, so before we even get trees in the ground, I promise I didn't coordinate with Mark, um, identify your goals. Um, so in terms of wildlife, what species do you care about? Do you care about one more than another? Are the aesthetics important? Um, all that um, is, is very important for, um, you know, managing, managing a stand for wildlife. And then income and management to an extent are kind of more of your limiter, limiting factors, you know, how much timber or pine straw income are you willing to forego in favor of wildlife? Um, likewise, what kind of equipment do you have access to? Are you going to be able to burn it? Um, you know, maybe you're, maybe you're backed up between an interstate, a hospital and a retirement home and GFC is never going to give you a permit. Um, so those are all things to kind of consider. Um, and again, like Mark said, you know, uh, wildlife generally speaking, doesn't really care about the trees so much as the understory. The understory is kind of where it's at. And that's, that's kind of the focus of what we're going to talk about. Uh, so in terms of planting trees, um, you know, step one, how many? Um, if you have wildlife as a priority, your lower, your lower densities are going to be better for wildlife just because it's, it's, a, it's less time before um, you really need to think about thinning it in order to open that canopy and get more light on the, on the understory. Uh, just keep in mind that a lot of the cost share programs um, do have minimum planting densities, like in Georgia, um, if you're planting under the longleaf pine initiative, you can't plant lower than 605. So that would be what you want to do. Also, at this time, you want to think about um, whether you want to have any wildlife openings. Um, keep in mind, these are not food plots. Uh, when I say wildlife opening, I just mean, you know, like a two acre opening that you're not going to plant in trees. And the idea with these is they're going to serve as little pockets of high quality habitat while the rest of the stand matures. Uh, the management for them is super easy. You burn it with everything else, maybe disc it every once in a while um, if you need to knock back the woody stuff. But uh, these openings are going to just hold your wildlife, you know, kind of as the rest of the stand changes. Um, they're, they're just good little pockets. Uh, likewise, before we even put trees in the ground, we want to be thinking about, you know, the long-term management. So burn blocks, fire breaks, all that. Um, you want to aim for these burn units of about 50 acres um, if you can. You know, this is all <laughs> in a perfect world where you have unlimited time and money and can do all this. Um, the idea being you can rotate these burn blocks. Um, so like in this in this um, map, you know, the green units are burned in even years. The blue units are burned in odd years. And uh, the idea is you're not having an entire huge area that is and an animal's entire home range that's burned in any given year. Uh, this is especially important for your ground nesting birds, um, but also, you know, just generally all wildlife. Um, it also kind of counterintuitively makes burning a little easier. Um, the more little subdivisions you have, the more opportunities you have to change how you're burning. Um, like, okay, maybe I can only burn this little 50 acres with an east wind, um, but if that was attached to another 200 acres, I wouldn't be able to do that. Um, so it does give you a little bit more flexibility, even though it's a little more complicated. Site prep. Um, I think site prep is underestimated how important it is, um, especially for wildlife. How you do your site prep is going to make a huge difference for the entire life of the stand. And to that end, you know, make sure whether you're whether you're working through GFC or you, you know, have a private forester, um, make sure you're talking to them. Make sure they know what your priorities are, uh, because otherwise they will probably just assume that your highest priority is we want the most biggest trees the fastest. Um, and if that's not your goal, you know, they need to know that because they, they'll, they'll switch up 
um, their site prep recommendations to kind of, you know, work towards what your goal actually is rather than, you know, just having them guess and hope you get it right. Um, you can't really go back and fix it after the fact. Uh, a few things specific to site prep, mechanical site prep. Um, if you have gopher tortoise, uh, we don't, you know, you don't want to be doing any heavy mechanical manipulation, your bedding, root raking, disking, uh, just because that'll tend to collapse or go for tortoise burrows. Um, likewise, um, a lot of that heavy manipulation is really bad for your native warm season grasses, which are, you know, great for carrying fire. They're, they're super important nesting material. Um, that said, you know, most of the research that's ever been done on this, um, you know, a roller chopper with a single pass and no extra weight on it is pretty okay for, for most of the understory stuff that we want to keep. Um, another common site prep practice is bedding. Um, and I, I honestly think bedding might be a little bit overused. Um, I was just driving the other day and I was, I drove past, it was like mid slope on a sand hill and it was bedded. They hadn't put trees in yet. Um, I don't think, but it was like, it was one of those, you look at it and you're like, I don't think they needed to do that, you know, or at least maybe not on the whole thing. Um, in addition to all that soil disturbance um, and you know how it can be detrimental to the understory, it also um, will change the fire behavior. Um, you know all those little valleys, all those little ridges are you know extra moist. You know these ones are holding water in the photo, but even if they weren't, they would be humid, and that changes your fire behavior. Um, I think it's a lot of why a lot of flatwood sites we have now we tend to see them dominated with you know gallberry, shrubby stuff, and historically those would have had a lot of grasses um and i think i think bedding is a big part of that just because the fire doesn't go through quite as quite as nicely as it used to um so you want to just think about this kind of stuff you know when you're when you're working with your contractor working with you know whoever's going to actually be doing the work on the plant on the land maybe the whole stand doesn't need to be bedded maybe just do it you know down low slope by the drains um you know there's just some things to consider Chemical site prep, and really this kind of applies to any chemical application. There's kind of four questions I think you should ask yourself when you're um, considering a chemical application. And it's, what do you want to save? Meaning, what don't you want to kill? What do you want to kill? What do you have that you're likely to release? A lot of the time that's like Blackberry. <laughs> um, and then how badly do you want it? Uh, how, much, how much money is it going to cost? How much time is it going to take to, to do the application in the way that you want? Um, I tend to think about herbicide application like shooting a gun, you know, you can't take it back and you want to make sure you hit what you're aiming at and not a whole lot else. Uh, and so to that end, you know, there's this, this principle of the lowest and the most, the lowest rate, so the least chemical, and the most selective herbicide that's going to, you know, control what you want to control. Um, because remember, we're, we're talking about the understory for wildlife. So the idea is you want to preserve as much of those good understory species as possible throughout the life of the stand. Um, kind of the only exception to the lowest and most um, idea is if you have invasive species, uh, site prep especially is the time to get rid of those, especially if you're converting pasture or, you know, you know you've got climbing fern out there. You know, site prep is when you want to nuke that stuff because once you have trees in the ground, your options really, really get restricted um, very, very quickly. Excuse me. Um, so, you know, some just some general takeaways on site prep. You know, consider what your site looks like, consider your soils, all that, uh, and don't over prep. Um, the the kind of forestry gold standard to maximize tree survival, you know, is a lot of times very heavy you know, mechanical um, site prep and heavy, heavy, you know, applications of like amazapir and glyphosate. And it's great for trees for survival, but it is pretty, pretty rough on the understory. And you end up with, you know, understory that kind of just looks like this, where it's just all briars um, and, you know, dog fennel and other stuff like that. Like you couldn't run a fire through that if you wanted to. Um, speaking of, uh, management with fire. So this is, you know, still kind of, best management stuff generally. Um, and we could talk for hours on fire and fire techniques and all that. Um, so when you're thinking about applying fire to your long leaf, you know, think about what your, what your understory has and what it doesn't have that you want more of. Um, so you might have very few woody species. That might be a point where you want to think about doing dormant season burns every once in a while, because that'll let more woody species come up. If you got a lot of woody stuff that you want to get rid of, 
you know, do, do some growing season burns. They're better at controlling those woody species. Um, and kind of this last little bullet point I added at the last minute, because lately there's been a lot of talk about, you know, oh, the growing season burns are burning up all the, you know, all the turkey and quail nests. And the reality is that's not true. Um, you know, these ground nesting birds preferentially nest in areas with like one to two year rough, which are the areas that you just burned. You're not burning them in this year. Um, and it gets back to those ideas with um, your burn blocks. If you give the birds the opportunity to nest in one to two year rough, that's where they'll nest. Um, so you want to give them the option to put a nest where you're not about to burn. Um, and, and, you know, finally, the reality is the, the habitat benefits from fire are always going to outweigh any, any, you know, nest lost to, to being burned up. Um, so it's, it's always a good, always a good idea. Um, real quickly to, um, you know, the technique you use while burning matters. And again, this, we could talk for hours and hours on just technique. Um, but backing fires are, you know, you burn it against the wind. Um, usually it's how most prescribed fires start. You start with a backing fire because it's real low intensity and safe, but it's also good at controlling those little woody stems um, because that flame is sitting around the stem long enough to cook it. It's, it's kind of, think about the difference between holding your hand over a candle for, you know, 10 seconds versus just quickly tapping a red hot burner. Um, you know, it just does a lot better job of transferring that heat to that woody stem to kill it. Um, and, you know, ring fires are an old technique. I hope no one is still using them, but if you are, please stop. <laughs> um, they, they don't really allow wildlife any avenues of escape. They get, they get very, very hot in the middle. Um, and they're just generally not, you know, a favored fire technique, um, for, for wildlife. However, um, they can be useful kind of on a smaller scale where you have something that you really, really want burned, like an old, you know, old deck. Um, you know, it's got a bunch of volunteer lob lolly coming up in it or something like that. Maybe an old brush pile you've decided you want to get rid of. Then yeah, like burn three out of the four sides of that, you know, light three of the four sides. Wildlife still can snake out of that one side that didn't, you know, didn't get lit and it'll still be, you know, pretty good at consuming that. Um, post burn evaluation is really important though. You want to assess how your fires have been affecting the wildlife habitat. What is it? burning what is it killing what is it saving um stay up on your burning even after you do that first burn after you plant to control brown spot keep burning after that um you know obviously in ways that are not going to harm your trees but the more you burn the easier it is to keep burning and the more you do that the less likely you are to you know have to go sink cost and time into chemical mechanical you know mid-rotation management which is not to say you absolutely won't have to um, fire is a great tool. It's not the only tool, but um, it'll, it'll definitely help minimize, you know, how much you end up having to spend on that. Um, and then as the stand matures, you know, it's funny, thinning is super important. When, when I meet with landowners, I talk about thinning a lot, um, but I only have one slide on it because it's very simple. Um, as the stand matures, you want to keep that basal area in that, you know, 40 to 70 feet squared per acre um, range, if possible. Um, quail, especially gopher tortoise, a lot of your non-game species as well. Um, that 40 feet squared breaker is a pretty important threshold. You get like nest success dropping off like a freaking rock. Um, once basal area gets higher than 40, uh, deer and turkey, a lot of your generalist species like that can, can be okay and a little bit higher. Um, and this gets into any, you know, any, any time you have somebody coming on to the property to do work where it's not equipment and people that you control. Um, make sure these contractors are cleaning their equipment uh, before they get out there. This, this would be a great little bullet point to put in, in, your, um, in your contract for anyone doing a thin or a harvest or whatever. Uh, I, I, I can't even tell you the number of times that I've, you know, met with a landowner and they'll say, oh, we had it, you know, we didn't used to have climbing fern all over the place, but it showed up like two years after thinning. And yeah, it's because those little scores probably came in on the contractor's equipment. So using good, reliable, you know, high quality contractors that you can, you know, you trust them to actually clean their equipment or, you know, have done so if they said they were going to, um, that's, that's really important because you, you want to keep those invasive species down. Um, real quick touch on pine straw. Um, it's not really a management thing. <laughs> it's more of a, a use. Um, pine straw profits are, you know, 
inversely related to the quality of the wildlife habitat in a stand. And there's not really any way around that. Um, so, you know, and, and it's, it's pretty, pretty obvious why. If you have enough trees and clean enough ground that you can make a lot of money raking straw, that also means that that ground cover is not there for wildlife. Um, so if you do need to rake straw for money, you know, to, to break even on the stand, like I'm not gonna hold it against you, that's fine. Um, but understand that the trade-off is there um, for wildlife habitat. Um, and I would say, you know, think real hard about placement of pine straw stands. If you've got, you know, a hundred acres that have decent understory and have been in timber for a while, and you've got 50 acres, that you're taking out of pasture or you know out of cotton peanut rotation and now you're going to plant trees there that old field that old pasture is where i would put my pine straw stand not in the good understory um they're also like a pine straw stand makes for a great shooting lane because it's really really open so if, if you're a hunter and you want some food plots um you know stick a food plot next to some good timber um, and then stick your stick your blind or whatever in the pine straw stand and, and shoot that way. They're they're great for that. Um, but yeah, just understand that that's that's a very very you know there's not really a good way around that trade off, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, in closing, you know, just some some real key things to remember. That site prep is going to influence what your stand looks like for a long long time. Um, so make sure you do that part right. It's it's a lot easier to keep what you have than it is to get it back. Um, and then as that stand goes through its life, you know, remember the sunlight on the ground is kind of the key. So lower initial stocking, keeping the basal area low, frequent fire um, to promote the understory, but also to keep those mid-story woody species from shading things out. All that's gonna benefit wildlife. And I think I'm about over time, so I'm gonna call it there. Um, and if we have time for questions now, or I will answer them at the end. Uh, my contact info is up there as well, so you can always reach out to me. Thanks, Tony. That was great. Do you see too with um, landowners when you visit their properties? And um, I feel like it's definitely something that more landowners are balancing and having some pine straw production, but also wanting to have wildlife habitat. Um, like you said, you're thinking about pine stand um, placement. So trying to keep that where you have connected wildlife habitat stands so they're not having to travel across. The yeah. One thing too, I would, I mean, I'd love to get like actual research on it, um, both economic and just in terms of like wildlife outcomes, but the whole idea of like ecological raking and, you know, like we know it's good for soil health. We know it's good for tree health. I, I'm curious, you know, and I don't think we've actually, you know, really established whether like 30 acres of high intensity pine straw and 70 acres of high quality, you know, timber and wildlife habitat is better or worse than 50 of ecological raking and 50 of high quality, quality habitat. Like figuring out where those thresholds are, um, I think is, is super important because I don't think we've really, we haven't really established that yet. Lots of good transition to our next um, speaker. And if anybody has more questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll have a little bit of time too at the end of the session. Um, but Wendy Ledbetter is gonna be our final speaker today. Um, she is the Longleaf Alliance's Fort Stewart Altamaha Partnership Coordinator in Georgia. And she'll be discussing managing Longleaf for various non-timber resources um, of which pine straw um, will be one of the topics she'll be touching on. So I'll hand it over to you, Wendy. Thanks, Susan. Can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see it in the slideshow, um, but not like the full slideshow where you can still see. But I think if you go down to the right and hit like the little presenter down at the bottom, that should do it. There. Okay, sorry. Okay. All right, sorry. <laughs> well, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm uh, gonna cover some of the non-timber resource opportunities for landowners today. And I will, uh, of course, add on with what uh, Tony and Mark said about 
uh, considering your management plan, how important that is for your uh, timber and non-timber resources. Um, and considering goals and objectives, your timeline, what your available resources are, and what your follow-up work plan will be um, continuing after you've started your work. And one of the things that uh, is important to consider, there's several factors. Of course, most of the work that we do, we're really interested and concerned about the biological and ecological impact of um, items. And uh, that includes your ground cover and your wildlife need and uses soil pro and soil productivity. The other things that are important to consider are, of course, the financial advantages and disadvantages of what you're planning to do with your non-timber resources and your legal and liability implications. For instance, if you're having a uh, hunting lease established, you know, what is the liability for having people on your property, that kind of thing. And then the logistical implications. If you're not living on site, if you're an absentee landowner, uh, you know, there's a lot of work and energy and effort with any type of resource management. And then finally, your personal impact. So if you're going to be doing the work yourself, as Mark mentioned, you know, maybe you're going to have a contractor, uh, you're going to depend on family members or friends or uh, hunt club members to work on your property. So those are things that are important. And it's also important to inform your, your family or your, uh, you know, whoever's working with you on your property, whoever's involved in the property, so they know what your wishes are. So one of the first um, opportunities for uh, resources is um, the plant materials that are on your property. And that can, can include a lot of things. Um, the most common known, of course, is uh, pine, pine cones, and particularly for longleaf because longleaf produces in uh, uh, every seven years or so is a, is a good production. Also, people collect for medicinal native plants, palmetto berries, which that can be controversial because that's a prime source of food for uh, American black bear. And then there's other products such as honey, leasing for bees, fruits, nuts, and mushrooms, and all sorts of plant material. So with all of these things, you have to think about what is the resource and how much do you want to deplete it and how much you need to protect. Of course, pine straw was, uh, of course, a focus for collection. Um, the advantages of why people pick pine straw, it's a, you know, it's a desirable landscape mulch. And on site, um, it, when you use it in your landscaping, these are all some of the values about why people will want to pick pine straw. And of course, it's available uh, in many of your re retail stores and box stores. And uh, there's a couple different ways that you can do pine straw. You can either mechanically bale, uh, you can do hand collection, which is more labor and time intensive. There's also an, a different way. One of our Mississippi landowners has shared with folks, and that's in terms of lifting straw, where he still has ground cover diversity, but he lifts the straw uh, as opposed to using a, a rake or a mechanical harvest. And so it allows him to maintain some of that ground cover, which uh, as, as Tony had said, could be valuable for insect or uh, some of your wildlife population. And of course, Georgia Forestry Commission, they do have a lot of information on site and we'll be sharing this uh, webinar afterwards. So you'll see that there's a directory of pine straw uh, folks that are available that can serve as your contractor um, and, and purchase, uh, purchase your straw and even manage it for you. Conservation easements are another um, information uh, uh, there's a lot of information out on conservation easements, but basically you're uh, deciding as a voluntary willing seller, it's not eminent domain, that you want to sell uh, or donate part of your rights on your property. And there put, there's put a evaluation on that, a value of that. And then the landowner works 
with their legal, their legal advice and attorney and works with uh, many organizations. Uh, a lot of conservation organizations are interested in easements. And it's a way that you can uh, see what you would like to have happen to your property in the future, particularly if you're at odds uh, with maybe some of your family members and you don't agree with each other, you still have the right to, you can set up a conservation easement. And so you're compensated for those rights and those values. And you agree with whoever you're doing the easement with on what is gonna be the covenants or the terms of the easement. And it's, this is really highly use, used and has become increasingly uh, popular to really work on protecting land and water features. And of course there's agricultural leasel, leases and historical leases as well. These are important, important to note though, these are illegally binding with the sale or transfer of a property. And a lot of people sometimes forget that. So if the property was to be sold um, or it passes through the family with a, a, a passing of someone that the easement stays with the property. And so it's important to let your family or whoever is working with you on a property ownership to know that the easement is in place. Easements are also usually uh, under a monitoring schedule, and this is to protect both the landowner and the easement uh, purchaser so that that the, the actual covenants or the terms of the easement are being honored. And sometimes, you know, once you do a transaction, some people might forget, hey, uh, hey, we need to just you know, we want to put in a new road, but under the terms of the easement, you have to consult or maybe work with the, the other easement uh, uh, partner to make sure that you're agreeing on the way and the, you know, the, the aspects of putting in a structure or an, a new road or, or a thing of, of that nature. So good communications and relationships and building a sense of trust and keeping in touch with people on your easement is most important to really having a successful easement. The other uh, program that a lot of people might have heard of, and it's particularly used with wetland conservation, or at least you probably heard about it a lot more, is mitigation banks. And mitigation banks are set up as for offering offsite uh, credits to be used. So typically it's a a company or an organization, and maybe they've built something and they've had an environmental impact on another project in another area, and they might have required a, a permit. So a lot of these, uh, these actions require that they do something to mitigate the uh, environmental damage or loss of habitat or species. And so this is um, hard to cover in 15 minutes with a, a project, but this is a a complicated sometimes and detailed um, uh, way of working with conservation. But a lot of times the Corps of Engineers is the key partner in this in, term, in terms of they determine the number of acres that are needed to mitigate and it's discretionary. It's gonna depend on a lot of factors. So can't really give you a, a hard and fast number, but it's often restricted in a location. It maybe might have to be in a certain county or it might have to be a certain habitat. And then they determine what would be the mitigation. So property owners, um, sometimes can have their, their acreage that are available to be enrolled in a mitigation bank. And there's, again, uh, much more information online. Uh, and I pulled up the website for mitigation banks in Georgia. And so you can have more details on those uh, to find out more about that. But that's another way of really working on, um, working on, uh, on having value with your property. And of course, right now with um, the information and the predictions for uh, warming, changes in climate, changes in environment, and the repercussions on species and habitat, carbon sequestration is, of course, a big topic. There's a public market and there's private markets. And there's really no federal incentive program that awards for carbon sequestration. Uh, most of it is through... Um, voluntary markets and compensatory work. So there's folks that uh, you, can, you can enroll as a private landowner. If you have 2000 acres or above, there's some programs that are made for larger acreage. And then there's other, several other companies that work with smaller acreage. And so 
you can contact one of these companies, they assess your land, they usually use aerial photography and information that you would provide. Some of the agreements can be for one year. The credits are done not by acre or by ton per se, but they're, they're established on a variety of factors. And then they'll work up an agreement that can vary in length and detail. And also some of these, um, these, uh, these agreements uh, can vary with where you are and what the demand is. So it's, again, a lot of uh, detail. And I did list on this, uh, one of the companies that we've had discussions with, um, we're not endorsing them in any way, but just to give you an example, this is a company. And if you look online, you'll find more companies, um, but those folks will work with uh, a landowner to find out your interests, to evaluate your property. And then if you choose to enroll, there's a bidding process uh, to award credits for, uh, for, uh, for enrolling in a carbon sequestration project. So it's a, a very popular uh, or growing, I'd say um, sequestration is a growing uh, effort. Um, and these were some stats that I took from online. Uh, there's a lot of property that, you know, you're looking at not only, as a reminder, not only the trees that store carbon, but also looking at the soil, the, uh, the woody debris, and, you know, the actual, all the vegetation on a site. So it's just more, it is more than the trees. And there's still a lot of work that's being done in terms of research to really uh, get a good handle on what the rates are and how we can utilize this to, to reward uh, landowners and incentivize landowners for maintaining good stewardship on their property and maintaining long-term uh, values of their resources that it can be uh, affordable for them to do so. Um, of course, uh, the final uh, interest is for payment for ecosystem services. And this again is an emerging uh, market. And I know Lisa on the call, she's been working quite a bit with this uh, for the Longleaf Alliance in terms of water. So people are really starting to try to look at these connections uh, on the landscape and how our resources provide us additional services that we don't sometimes hard to quantify, but are of value. And again, incentive for landowners to help protect and restore and manage forested lands, uh, longleaf included, that would help for protecting our air, war, water, and soil and features of a watershed. And so I listed one example, South Carolina and Georgia, uh, and uh, Lisa could tell you more on this. And I put the website on for Savannah River Clean. And basically they're working uh, to help uh, why, uh, determine ways that forest landowners can, uh, can provide value and provide uh, additional sources of income for, for landowners. Um, so, uh, that's kind of the, the summary of, no, of non-timber resources. I know it's a lot of information. Uh, we'd be happy to put you in contact with anybody, uh, to for more information on non-timber resources and also, uh, have, uh, we'll be sharing this, uh, this, this, uh, program as well. So thank you all. Thanks, Wendy. Yeah. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And um, Tony and either of our other speakers too, Wendy or Mark, y'all might want to chime in on this. And we did have one question come in from Carla Gaskins. Um, she's asking, having only done dormant season burns for the past 10 years, when and how does she go over to growing season burns? Um, so for example, if she burned in January and February of this year of 2022, would she plan slash schedule to burn in summer of 2024? Um, and wildlife habitat is one top priority for her. So if one of y'all wants to hop in with some thoughts on that. Yeah, I would say, I mean, if you've burned, you know, if you've been burning already regularly for the last 10 years, you know, you probably don't have, I assume a lot of fuels built up that are, are a problem. And you're really thinking about just woody reduction, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I would say summer of 2024, um, 
you could even do summer of 2023 if you have enough stuff, you know, grasses, pine litter, that kind of stuff on the ground to carry the fire. Um, at 10 years, you're not really worrying super much about like intensity killing the trees, um, unless it's, you know, some really, really hot fuels, palmetto and, you know, gallberry, real heavy on that stuff, then, then yeah, you probably want to try to reduce that a little bit before you switch to full on growing season fires, just because they're going to be a little hotter. I, I hate giving the answer where it's like, it depends, but it, it, it does. <laughs> No, it's definitely not a one size fits all and it can depend a lot property to property, site to site on what's going on out there and year to year what's happened. Um, well, if any other questions um, come in, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, also wanted to, um, oh, we have one more come in. Um, Russ Tillman, I need to burn a small stand of two-year-old pine this month, but it's hot and dry. Is that too dangerous? Will it harm? my trees. I, I assume two year old longleaf. Um, I don't know that I would. <laughs> I, I, I would at least wait for it to get a good rain <laughs> and, you know, let things, let things get a little wetter, but we're, we're really getting towards the tail end of burn season. I mean, North Georgia is already in the burn ban. Um, so if, if you're not super, super comfortable with fire, I, I wouldn't do it. Yeah, I, I agree with Tony. Um, it also depends on your fuel load in that stand too. So, but a two-year-old, I would be real hesitant to do that. I would probably wait the next year when you're in maybe, maybe the dormant season before I try to tackle that one. Thanks, y'all. Um, one other thing that I want to share with everyone that's on today's webinar um, is we do have a, a Longleaf Management Field Day coming up. Um, and this will be a week from today on May 25th. So if you enjoyed today's webinar um, and are in Georgia or North Florida and want to travel a little bit, um, it'll be at Dixon Memorial State Forest. So some of the topics that we covered today, we'll have field tour stops. Um, and you'll get to see some of these in person, have a little more um, in-depth discussion. It'll be from 9 a.m. to noon. Um, we did a short and sweet webinar today. Um, and this is the emails for all of our um, speakers today. A lot of them had it at the end of their slides as well, but feel free. They're such a great resource and experts um, in their fields. Um, so feel free to reach out with, to them and, and um, with any follow-up questions or questions that might come up after you've had some time to, to think about today, um, kind of some of the topics we've touched on. And also going to, we have a couple questions on a poll as we're planning um, webinars in the future. Would love to get your, your feedback. Um, and one more question came in, I'll put the poll up, but um, from Joseph, uh, how much red clay can longleaf take to still grow well? If one of our speakers wants. That's, a, that, that's kind of a tough one. When you start getting in the upper coastal plain, you start getting out of the range of longleaf. That's when you start really picking up your red clay. Um, but they're also, with that being said, around, you know, southwest Georgia, there's also lots of red clay in those soils. So um, it, it's, it's so site specific. You, you almost have to have somebody come out and look at it, you know, um, to, you know, the, to determine that. A lot of the time, it seems like, you know, it's not so much will it grow well, it's will it be vastly outgrown by, you know, lob and slash. Yeah, um, right. right. That's, that's, it's not, it's not that it won't grow. It's just that, you know, maybe, maybe those are situations where, you know, you might get a better return from, you know, a different species, something like that. Yeah. I, I know native long start dropping out about the fall line. So um, I would be really careful planting, you know, that, that far north. Unless it's spontane long leaves, and that's a whole nother, yeah. whole, whole nother species. So we hadn't talked about that today. I mean, you could probably get that in the next 60 seconds, Mark. You know? uh, <laughs> I don't know if I could or not. That'll be a, a separate webinar for that one. <laughs> 
Um, well, thanks everyone so much for tuning in today. It is the top of the hour. Um, appreciate everyone tuning in. I hope that um, everyone had a great experience. We love getting to interact with y'all. I mean, feel free to, to reach out. Like I said, if y'all have any questions or there's anything further any of us can help with. And I'm looking forward to seeing y'all at the next webinar um, or field day. Thanks everyone.